Hello, folks. This is your host, Tammy Tucky, and you are now listening to the Tierra Talk Show. We bring you rare interviews with the makers of Disney magic. Whether they be singers, actors, Imagineers, animators, they have all made their mark on the Disney name. Be sure to check out the show notes, other episodes, contests, our social media pages from Facebook to Twitter, and more on our official website at www.thetierratalkshow.com. All guest opinions are theirs and theirs alone and do not represent the opinions of the Tierra Talk Show or the host. The Tierra Talk Show is not associated with the Disney Company. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode. And from all of us here at the Tierra Talk Show, have a hoop de doo day. I'm excited to welcome this week's Tierra Talk Show guest, animator Darren Butters, to the show. Welcome, Darren. Hi, Tammy. How are you? I'm doing swell. How are you? We haven't seen each other in, has it almost been six months? <laughs> Is that uh, D23, right? Yes, it, it was, uh, you were hosting a couple of panels. You were hosting the Aladdin panel and I think the short film panel, correct? Yes. Oh my gosh, that was a lot of fun. I am so lucky to get to do those things. Uh, those are the highlights of my year. As somebody who hosts a podcast, I feel it's not easy to always you know, gather up all the questions and ask as many as you want during a specific amount of time because, you know, everybody's looking at the watch, you know, trying to make sure the panel, you know, goes accordingly. So how do you prep for these panels? We have a set uh, schedule, I guess, a a set uh, amount of material that we try and tear through. Uh, We get a little talkative uh, because we're really into uh, you know, we've we've been working on these projects forever or uh, projects that we're very attached to. And then when we get in front of an audience, we just want to give them a little bit more. And as a host, uh, I'm trying to keep everyone kind of on on the the track so that uh, it doesn't spiral off into a four hour conversation. Those panels are amazing uh, because I love seeing people's reaction to our material and meeting the people that are the real fans, the, the people that we really make uh, these movies for uh, it, it recharges me. It, it, it makes me, you know, cause you're in the trenches and you're uh, you know, you could get a little bitter about, you know, uh, work schedules or uh, you know, certain shots that got, cut but when you uh, show up to those conferences you really realize that uh, you have the best job in the world and that these people just love the art that you're making for the fans i feel that we get an, a, a better and a clear understanding of how you guys are working through these processes just to get this film out because a lot of animated films take years and years to make. So it's not something that's, you know, quickly done and it, and it's a lot of hard work and effort that goes into it. And I think we just gain a lot more appreciation for you. Yeah, and, and even though you know how the trick is done, it's still an amazing trick. Uh, like Penn and Teller, they reveal, sometimes when they're doing their trick, they reveal how they're doing it and then they wow you with their craft and the way they're doing it rather than keeping a secret from you. And I always, uh, I've always been a big fan of theirs. And I, I enjoy letting people in on the secrets of how we do some of this stuff and watching them build a respect and a love for it even more. And one of the first Disney projects you got to work on was the 1999 dinosaur film. Yeah, that was a, an interesting time in Disney's history. They uh, were trying to build a, a, a digital studio. They, they had to build an entire wing of this new technology. They had such a legacy of the uh, uh, traditional animation. And it was it was really kind of a a time for discovery. The pre-production on that film was like four years or something. Like it, it was luxurious. Uh, we, we got to uh, do a bunch of tests. We got to try out different software. We got to go to the zoo a lot to study rhinoceros and ostrich and all that stuff. I, I was fortunate enough to uh, jump in when they were hiring a lot of people who showed a lot of potential, Uh, not necessarily tried and true animators, but 
people who were willing to test the, the, the new technology. I showed my reel to the, the director. The, the, he was then the head of animation, Eric Layton. He saw that I knew how to animate on the computer, but he also saw that I did theater and I grew up doing puppet shows and magic shows. And he hired me more for my performance experience. He said, we could teach any goofball the computer, but it's this need to show the audience something, this need to, to uh, put on a performance that we really can't teach. It was a very interesting time, and I learned so much on that movie because there was so much realism and detail and weight it was, uh, I, that first two years, I learned so much on the job uh, that I, because I didn't really go to an animation school. I, I was kind of self-taught. So I had a lot to learn and boy, did I, I was a sponge those first couple of years. And that really helped when you kind of jumped to the actual theme parks working on the Fantasia scene in Mickey's Philhar Magic. It was such a unique experience, you know, having something that's rather not just 3D, but 4D. Yeah, Donald Duck goes through uh, Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast and Fantasia. And it was a great variety of uh, characters and, and settings. And, and that was amazing the working on a ride is so much different than especially a 3d ride so much different than a movie with the 3d there's very you have to pick your moments to use that effect and so we're we're experimenting with a bunch of different things and you know i'd never worked on a on a 3d movie before we're learning a lot of stuff and to be able to animate a classic character like Donald Duck was such a treat. There was so much to to pull from the archives of how to animate this uh, this character. I didn't get to choose the scenes that I did, but I was lucky to get that Fantasia sequence where the brooms bring in all that water and uh, these giant brooms with this tiny little baby broom that uh, had so much character and Donald Duck is so upset that he's getting, you know, drenched. Just talking about it now, I remember all the problems we had with the aerial pup or, uh, rig in that and how our first versions of it looked so um, lifeless and it didn't look like aerial. It didn't, we weren't able to achieve the character and the appeal from Glenn's drawings. We looked at it as a final product and that really stuck out as a failure of our ability to, to transfer those traditional characters to a 3D character. And we reanimated all of those shots with uh, Glenn as the lead of that sequence. I tell you what, after... After his drawovers and uh, the revisiting of this through his supervision, it really, it was 180 degrees from where we were. I think for a lot of the adults, you know, once we get to that whole new world sequence, I think as adults, we're totally, we feel like kids again because we feel immersed in the world and we feel included with the kids because the kids are reacting. And at this point, we're like, we're yeah. flying on a magic carpet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I feel it's the same way with Zootopia, which I just saw this past weekend. What'd and you think? I, I, I adored it. I loved it. And, and like, I didn't know what to think of it at first because I remember when we were presented with some of the material, I think it was not even this past D23, the previous D23. And I, and I wanted to go into the detail of th there's four different worlds and this train kind of goes through them with all the animals. Can you talk about how you guys made the decision on these specific worlds being featured in the film? Because I just find it th the, uh, environments are just very fascinating yeah we we knew that the animals would all have to live together but they still have certain uh needs and environmental uh 
uh, environments that they that they need to stay in. So just like in New York, where there's different neighborhoods for different cultures, we divided it up into different uh, ecosystems. In Sahara Square, where all the desert animals lived, we, we thought that that would be neat if it was kind of more of an upscale uh, Dubai, Monte Carlo type atmosphere instead of a stark desolate desert it was this thriving uh glamorous hub of you know like like dubai where where the development of resort hotels is is huge and we knew that there was uh needed to be a tundra town a a a place for cold weather animals to live like moose and polar bear and if you've ever had an air conditioning, a window air conditioner, there's in one side of it, the cool air is blowing in, but on the outside, there's hot air blowing out. We thought that would be a perfect uh, border for these two environments. One is uh, blowing cold air into Tundra Town, but in the back of this air conditioning system, uh, hot air was blowing into Sahara Square to, to keep it to keep it warm. And uh, the Rainforest District is a, a totally different neighborhood because it's a vertical neighborhood. Instead of spreading out, they build up to the canopy of the, of the rainforest. Uh, a lot more goes into these movies than people know about. First and foremost, we try to make movies that everyone can relate to uh, or that everyone can uh, be entertained by. And when we came up with this concept of predator and prey living together and the tensions that that has, especially with our main characters where they're natural enemies and they're forced to work together, that kind of conflict, that kind of tension, it isn't something like a message that we're trying to shove down people's throat or anything. It's just a symptom of the drama that we're trying to create. And so... It's interesting to see how this environment that we set up and these two characters that we force together, it kind of brings out issues that are relevant uh, in everyone's lives. I want to tell our listeners that they should definitely go out and see Zootopia as soon as you can, whether you have kids or you don't, or just want to go out and have a great time and enjoy a film that does bring up questions and and topics and discussions that should be talked about today. And also plenty of jokes. You know, you have Flash the Sloth and everybody adored him. (laughs) Oh, he was so fun. But um, before we end the show, I have three Disney questions I always ask my guests. I, I call them the Fab three so uh-huh. we'll start yes. with the donald question uh-huh. so as a child what disney film was one of your favorites to see in the movie theater oh goodness uh i would have to say robin hood and our goofy question <laughs> what disney character do you think would be your best friend if you met them in person Hmm. flynn rider And finally, our Mickey question. If I asked you to name any Disney song at this very moment, what immediately comes to mind? A whole new world. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Darren. It was it was an absolute pleasure. I want to remind listeners to go ahead, see Zootopia, check it out, and also follow Darren at Darren Butters on Twitter. And I think you're also on Instagram, right? I think so. There you go. They can follow you there. (laughs) And we hope to have you back because we know you're working on Moana. Yeah, I got my first shot on that approved uh, yesterday. Oh, that's great. That's so exciting. It's going to be it's going to be such a beautiful movie. Well, thank you again for coming on the show. Thanks, Tammy. Try everything. No matter what type of animal you are, change starts with you.